You're listening to Mission Eve, a podcast that explores the stories of women who are opening the frontier of space to humanity. Your host is Megan Crawford, managing partner of Space Fund, a venture capital firm investing in the space industry. She is a mother, volunteer, founder, and true believer in humanity's future in space. Mission Eve is meant to inspire the girls of today who will be the women of tomorrow, leading our first permanent off-world settlements. Space needs women. Space needs you. Welcome to Mission Eve. I'm your host, Megan Crawford, and I am thrilled to have with me today, Rebecca Rounds. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. It's great it's to be here. exciting to have you on. And Thank you. Uh, let's just start at the beginning. Okay. Um, let's talk about where you were born, where you grew up, and did that have any influence on uh, on you getting into the space industry? <laughs> Well, I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, It did not have a big effect on me uh, in getting into the space industry. My father was a science teacher. He's been a science teacher all my life. Um, But really, I I was always interested in space. Um, Did not go into it until later on, uh, actually after my undergrad. And uh, growing up, I loved things like Star Wars and Star Trek. And I remember what one very poignant memory to me is walking across the school grounds, not wanting to walk past the older kids and wishing that, and this is so silly, but wishing that the Millennium Falcon would sweep down and get me and take me someplace else. Right. right. So, but the, those are like the memories I have of, of thinking about space, reading about space, being so interested in what was out there. Um, But I never really, when I was younger, thought that the capability was there for me. For it to be a career. For it to be a career, right? Right. I could enjoy it. I could read about it. I could, you know, daydream. But it was not something that I saw right there within reach. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Did you, were there any defining moments or uh, specific people that, uh, you know, any time in your childhood that kind of helped spark that, that space interest for you? My older brother was very, and I know that's, you know, but he was very much into space. And so I would watch things with him or read things that he had laying around. Um, As far as uh, career wise, um, I remember I was young when the movie Space Camp came out and I watched it and was very enthralled with what was going on and the fact that these kids had a mission or or accidentally were in space and had to deal with the mission there. Um, And I just that was also very poignant uh, to me. Uh, But I just kind of uh, really didn't get into space myself or involved in the arena until I was working for, I was a legal fellow for the chairman of the space subcommittee on Capitol Hill. And he had a female rocket scientist on staff, Megan Mitchell, who had me doing a lot of research for her uh, related to space act agreements and indemnity uh, and all kinds of other issues And it really sparked an interest in me. Uh, I had gone into law school interested in um, international law and dispute resolution and intellectual property and really didn't know how those were all going to blend. And when I started doing and helping Megan uh, with things when the Space Authorization Acts was was um, they were trying to push it through at that time. I just really got enthralled and Megan pulled me in more and more with what was uh, what was happening there. And so I decided to pursue my LLM in air and space law. And I did that through the University of Mississippi. And that's really how I got into space myself. Excellent. Excellent. So let's um, let's back up there a little bit and and talk about kind of your educational career, oh, let's sure. say, um, what, you know, when you graduated high school, you, mm-hmm. you were, you're so excited for the future. What comes next? So <laughs> I have a very non-traditional career path. Excellent. Um, excellent. Let's hear all about thank it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, in my twenties, I, I thought I was going to go into the ministry 
And I attended a small Christian college thinking that I would do something and go out and help people. Um, And that didn't end up happening. So my 20s, I spent traveling, um, really seeing what I could of the world. And I was turning 30. And I decided that I had always wanted to be an attorney. And I was turning 30. And I decided I was going to go back and get an undergrad that would allow me to get into law school. And I worked full time uh, and went to school full time for the next four years and got my bachelor's degree in communications. Uh, My earlier career path and life had kind of revolved around communications and uh, reading. I grew up very reading a whole lot. um, And that led me to kind of pursue a communications degree and um, working with writing and things like that. So I got my communications degree in 2008 and worked for three more years and went to law school. And from there, I, um, again, I didn't know what I was going to do. And so an op- there was an opening with the chairman of the space subcommittee on Capitol Hill. And I took it because I wanted to go back home near home. I was going to school in Mississippi for my JD. And so I went back not knowing what would happen and got the space bug. Uh, And I say I got the space bug. I had always been interested in space, but working with the people on Capitol Hill and with Megan Mitchell showed me that there was an arena for me in space. I didn't have the hard science background. Um, I, I never pursued that area, but being able to identify something that would allow me to have an impact on the space arena was life changing for me. Um, and I now call my, myself a space geek or a space law junkie or <laughs> many other things, yeah. but, um, but I love it because it's an area that's being carved out, still being carved out, and we're still having an impact on it. And, and what we're doing now is going to have long-term impact um, for generations. You know, whether we're doing things to um, help uh, work towards environmental change with what's going on um, with Earth observation or what we're doing to... Um, limit space debris or what we're doing with diplomacy to help um, the international community grow together rather than continuously combat. Um, I think international law related to um, space is in the Outer Space Treaty is a great diplomatic tool that hopefully we'll be able to use for many, many more years. (laughs) Excellent, excellent. So, so tell me about this uh, this degree you went and got after you got your your personal oh, space bug. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. So it was through the University of Mississippi. It's um, an LLM in air and space law. And what's an LLM? It's a master's of law. So okay. it is a, um, a specialized focus. It, LLMs provide a specialized focus for gotcha. for lawyers. Uh, for yeah. lawyers, right? And I was able to do it remotely. So I worked as a, yeah, no, it was great. Um, I did all of my classes remotely while I was working as an attorney at an IT company in Maryland. And uh, just the most fascinating professors uh, associated with the international space community. Um, PJ Blunt was one of my professors. Um, Michael Dodge was a professor. Um, I was able to have a one-on-one class with um, Fabio Tranchetti, who is an international lawyer uh, dealing with space matters. Uh, And we would have a uh, Sunday morning call, three-hour call, and just talk about space. And being able to talk space and walk away, some people get really drained when when you have to um, go over a subject matter for hours. But I, I was always just like had my adrenaline pumping at the end of all of those calls. So in, in my classes. And so it was the right decision for me to pursue that degree. But, um, yeah. 
Great. And so then what came next? So now you've, now you're a lawyer, you've got your yes. space specialization. I assume you right. stopped working at the IT company yes, and yes, did something yes. a little more spacey, well, right? Right. <laughs> yes. So I moved out to California. I was working for a telecommunications law firm in California. And, um, since that point I have branched off and I have my own law firm and my own policy space law and policy company. And I help my focus is startup companies. I really like to help startup companies understand, uh, what are some pitfalls or hurdles that they're going to need to overcome in moving towards, uh, commercialization of their products and ideas and services. So. Excellent. So this is a lot of talk about say, um, um, export import yes. controls yes. and restrictions yeah. and yeah. Yeah. yeah and certifications and uh, it's hard to balance sometimes the excitement for the idea with the reality of the process right and so to be able to spur the excitement while um providing a list of things that really need to be done um i try to walk that balance in a way that doesn't show the companies that there's a huge limitation, but you know, they're just things that we can get through and we're going to work through. That's how I like to present it. Uh, absolutely. So, um, can you tell, I, I, I'm really interested in that. Um, I'm very interested in, in startups for a lot of my own reasons. So, so tell me a little bit about, you know, I, I mentioned export import controls, but kind of what are those other things that are unique to space companies and, and, and make, space lawyers a thing that even need to happen, right? Right, right. So if you're talking about um, ITAR and what's necessary, um, you know, there are limitations on who companies can work with, for example, or who they can bring in um, based on dual use technology issues or, um, you know, ensuring that our... uh, materials or ideas are not being uh, provided to the wrong people, right? Um, Things like providing correct documentation for the process. Right. Things like that. Yeah. It just, it gets, it gets a little messy. It does get very messy. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, I also want to hear more about the policy work you're doing. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So I, have done a lot recently with more of a wireless policy technology direction. Um, I am working with, uh, again, some small companies to try to reach out to um, congressional uh, persons who have the um, involvement in where policy is going to go. Um, And so that's what I've been doing recently. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So what's, um, what's your day to day job like, right? How much, you know, where do you spend your time? What do you, you do, what do you do mostly during, during any given normal day? Right. So um, my firm, I do, um, I do a lot of corporate work, um, as well as the space law and the, the corporate contract transactional, uh, work is again, the, the basic, this is what needs to be done. Um, but the, the interaction with the clients is really what helps me to stay involved with the space arena. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to someone who wanted to break into this field? Well, I would, it it depends on the arena that they want to go into the field because the field isn't just one specific uh, area, well, right? Well, you know, I mean, yeah, space yeah. law space specifically, law. yeah. Right. So what I would do, what I would say is stay up on current policy, where it's going, um, attend conferences, stay up to date on what's happening. Um, the ABA conference, for example, the ABA space law um, forum has a conference, a mid-year conference every year and a an annual two-day conference. So there's a one-day forum and then a, a two-day conference. And attend that and see what's happening. And that's the um, American Bar Association? Yes, yeah, the yeah, American yeah. Bar Association. Um, uh, attend the conferences, but don't stick to 
just the legal conferences, right? Go to ISPCS, see what's happening at ISPCS, um, figure out what's happening um, with the uh, new companies, new ideas that are coming out, attend conferences, um, read a lot. It's really important to read and see what's happening. Um, find a mentor, you know, um, uh, see who's in the arena and really try to talk to them and get involved. Volunteer. Volunteering is really important. Uh, I'm involved with a nonprofit in North Carolina, um, and they've had me guest lecture on space law and policy every summer for the last three summers. And what I do is I remote in and I talk to these kids. They have kids come in um, for learning center camps, and the it's the organization is a is located at a former NASA facility that we were able to. Uh, acquire through an act of Congress um, that allows us to um, give kids experiential learning, hands-on experiential learning that, you know, they're able to come in and see the 26 meter telescopes, for example, um, work with the equipment and see that there's a way for them to move forward with uh, careers that they may n- have never experienced. Yeah. You know, they're getting experiences that I never got when I was a kid. And so to be able to see that, um, for me, even volunteering there and seeing that has enabled me to reach out to others to get them involved with the organization. That's really valuable to me. Yeah. And I think it would be valuable to anybody that's trying to break into the field. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, what was, what was your first job? Your very, very first job and how old were you? Oh, so I was probably 10 or 11 and I was a, I delivered newspapers. Oh, fun. Yeah. It was Uh, fun. Um, no, I walked had a Uh, a bag bag over over the shoulder. And when I was a kid, uh, yeah, fun until, um, it was, uh, you know, zero degrees outside in Wisconsin and the snow is, you know, (laughs) up to your hips and stuff like that. Um, but that it was a, it taught me hard work, right? Um, that was my first job. My first, uh, uh, I guess company job was working at a small cafe called Rosie's cafe. And I was a dishwasher there and they gave me an opportunity to work weekends when I was 13 or 14. Um, and so I worked weekends and carried, you know, smelly dishes around and <laughs> <laughs> had to do with the heat of the kitchen, but it, it was a really good experience and, and I'm grateful for it. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, you've been in the space industry a few years now, yes. you've mm-hmm. been around, you kind of, you know, you know, the industry and having worked previously in totally different industries, um, can you think of any unique challenges of being in space um, and, and talk a little bit about uh, about that and how maybe sure. you've overcome those? Sure. So uh, it, space is a really small, tight knit community. Right. We've got a few companies that are doing, um, you know, uh, really focused launches. We have satellite companies. Um, we have you know, a small group of attorneys that deal with space. And that can be intimidating because with such a tight knit group, um, there may be concerns about how to break that barrier, right? When people have worked together for 20 years and you're a new person on the scene, uh, how do you, how do you, how do you break into that? Uh, And one thing I would go back to is just attend the conferences, get to know people. People are people. Even though it's a tight-knit group, it's a very open group. We have this connection and excitement for where we can go and the hope of what we can do, right? And so when you bring something to the table that's spurring that excitement, that motivation, um, that encouragement, that capability to talk about new ideas, that capability and that way to um, discuss ideas, churn new ideas and propel us into, you know, further into the future. I think people will really grasp onto that, 
you know, and, and we'll be more open. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, where do you see yourself in, in 10 or 20 years? Where, how do you see your, your career developing? Sure. So I would like to be working, uh, more in the international community. Um, again, going back to my earlier comment, I, I think the outer space treaty is a really great diplomatic tool and I would like to really, um, see how we can develop, uh, more relationships, um, to get us further into space, to, to get our goals further completed. Um, you know, I'd like to help develop interplanetary, um, uh, agreements. Uh, I'd like to nurture relationships between parties that are going to be, uh, settling other planets. I would like to help promote the idea that space is not just a hard science, but a blending of the social sciences and that we need the social sciences with the hard sciences to really, truly succeed. Um, when we're there, obviously we're, we're in space, we're doing things in space, but when we talk about, um, long-term settlement, when we talk about, um, you know, exploring and, and, uh, finding habitats that, are, that we can really live in, you know, it's not just a point of being able to live there. It's being able to live with each other while we're there. And so I would like to help promote that. Excellent. Excellent. So tell me a little bit more about the outer space treaty and why you think it's so important. Oh, sure. Well, with the outer space treaty, um, and I, I tell the students about this that I talk to in the summer times, they, the Outer Space Treaty is so important because without it, um, the Outer Space Treaty was signed in 1968. Uh, under the Outer Space Treaty, there's no sovereignty over space or, or, or the moon and celestial bodies. There's no sovereignty, right? Well, in 1969, we planted our flag on the moon, right? Any other time prior to the Outer Space Treaty, we could have potentially said, hey, this is ours, right? But... The Outer Space Treaty creates this environment that we, as humanity, can um, find uh, common ground. It doesn't have to be about uh, my ide ideology versus your ideology. Now, yes, you know, um, Russia has its own ideas about space and China has its own ideas about space, right? But, and, and we do as well, but being able to come back to a common ground and say, we can do this together. There's hope to do this together. I think that that's really um, important. So the Outer Space Treaty uh, talks about there's, there's no sovereignty over space and um, we are going to, to use space for value and for the value of humanity. And, um, uh, we're going to use it for peaceful purposes. And there's been a lot of back and forth discussing, well, is weaponization of space? Can we do that for defensive purposes? And yes, we need to protect ourselves, but at the same time, we need to find a way forward. And I think the Outer Space Treaty has helped us do that to this point. Um, and I hope it continues. I hope we continue to use that to move forward. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, you know, most of us in this industry are... Um, passionate, right? Yeah, right? I think, I think a little bit more passion than, than you find in, in most industries. But, um, yeah. I, I see, I find that that tends to kind of spill over into the rest of our lives right. too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I'd love for you to talk for a few minutes and, and I know you already mentioned some, some stuff here, but, um, things that you do outside of your career that are, um, either space related or just volunteer causes that you're passionate about. Right. Right. So, uh, I mentioned Perry earlier. That's the nonprofit in North Carolina that I'm involved with. Um, I, I go up, out there about three or four times a year um, to work, uh, and I remote in for for guest lectures with them. Actually, one of the really pinnacle things that has happened that happened for me when I was in Perry is I was giving a speech 
uh, or a lecture to the students on space law and policy. And the one of the leaders of the group came in the next day and one of the students had written on the board, I want to be a space lawyer, you know, on the whiteboard. And I still have that picture. And so to me, um, really being involved in Perry and what it's doing is, is just immensely important. Um, you know, Perry is not just about elite kids coming in and getting an education. They want to create STEM accessibility for everyone. And going back to me being a kid and not even having that learning experience, if I had had that learning experience, maybe I would have gone in a direction earlier, a different direction in my earlier career. But being able to give students that opportunity is and that experiential learning is what I'm really passionate about, what I love seeing happen um, outside of my career. Um, I'm involved with the ABA Space Law Committee um, to help um, move the direction of space law and inform people of the direction of space law and where we're going. Um, uh, I attend events like Spaceport LA, Right. So we recently were able to do a, a, an event called Cowboys and Outlaws and talking. We talked about, you know, the difference. Who are the outlaws? Are there really outlaws uh, with the space arena? Um, you know, kind of comparing it to the the frontier kind of. And, you know, space is con- the final frontier. Right. right? right. Yeah. So we. uh <laughs> I involve myself in those kind of activities. I, I try to stay up on what's happening in the news with space. I try to event, uh, attend events. Um, so th- those are kind of the things that I involve myself in to stay involved in space. You know, Cowboys and Outlaws sounds fun. Oh, no, it was great. They, they gave me a cowboy hats and every, hat, hat and everything. Yeah, but no, it was a really great event. We had someone, one of the um, attendees, drove his motorcycle across half halfway across the country and um not attendees one of the panelists mm-hmm. drove his motorcycle cross country was that um, brian stofiel it was brian stofiel <laughs> yes it was yeah, okay. yeah 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 um you know it is a small industry like you said we do know yes yes yeah 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 it is <laughs> you know um and i what keeps me inspired is seeing what's happening with people like bella you know, Bella Stofil is such an amazing, um, energetic kid who's so excited about the future. And she is um, really, you know, a poster child for what can be done when you give education to somebody and allow them to learn themselves, right? Yeah. And to spur themselves. And, um, you know, that's really exciting. And it's exciting to see the new generations come up. I, 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 I consider myself a new generation because I'm, you know, didn't grow up in this with my career, right? right? It's, it's relatively new, but, um, just being able to be involved with it and see who's coming up and what they're going to be doing and what they're, um, looking to do is just, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's yeah. fun. It yeah, is it's fun. really Watch, fun. Yeah. Watching, the, watching everything grow, watching the excitement yeah. grow and all the new people. Um, I agree with you. It's been, a, yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the future, right? Okay. So yeah. what's your vision for humanity's future in space? Well, I mean, um, I'd love to see the Federation how, you know, right. right? Yeah. So Star when Trek I talk, thing. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, when I talk to people about being in space law and policy and they're like, what's that? And when did I say, Oh, I'm just helping write the rules of the Federation. Right. Yeah. And so they're kind of like, <laughs> Oh, you know, obviously not, but right. yeah, I would love to see humanity really, um, really find a way forward, you know, in a way that's sustainable for our planet. And I would love that, you know, our going into space would help bring the planet back to some health as well. Um, uh, Yeah, but I would love to see settlements. I would love to see people living in space and, and interacting and you know, not settling planets and deciding that they're, uh, you know, 
not naming the planet after themselves, for example, but like <laughs> realizing that we're all in this together and we need each other to survive and to continue. I think that that's a, it's one of my goals, you know, and I, I'm excited to see what the future brings. I'm excited to see, you know, how, how close we are to people really consistently going into space. That's huge. Right. Um, ugh, being able to, um, touch the stars, right? right? That's like, it's pretty cool. And, and, and we're closer than ever. And I think, um, you know, when I'm an old lady, an old, old lady, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to say, yeah, I saw this much happen in this little bit of time. I, you know, my great grandmother rode across country in a covered wagon oh, right. and then lived to see a man walk on the moon. That's amazing. Right. right? So, so what if we can we see do? that kind of right. change in our lifetimes, yeah, right? Yeah. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. yeah. So amazing. Yeah, so. absolutely. I agree. Yeah. And what do you think from, from a legal perspective, since, since you have so much expertise there, what, what do you think are the things that need to happen to enable that vision? Right. So we need to streamline domestically, we need to streamline regulations. We need to make it, um, in the, uh, the law arena talks a lot, a lot of, about, um, prescriptive regulations versus performance-based regulations. And I think that we need to create more uh, and provide an opportunity for more performance-based regulations rather than, um, requiring commercial entities to jump through so many hoops um, and to get so many signatures. And obviously, you know, they have to go through the FAA and they have to go through the FCC if they're dealing with, you know, communications and they have to go through, um, you know, dealing with uh, if they're interacting with civil space, right. Or with the DOD, right. So there's so many hoops that they have to jump through. And I, I would like to see, um, uh, more of a streamline. I'd like to see a balancing act. Um, you know, we we have laws that there's such a convergence and divergence of um, domestic law within the three areas of law, commercial, civil, and national security space. And everything can converges, but um, there are divergences that create problems, right? So if we are um, ITAR, you brought that up, for example. Um, you know, we're trying to promote commercial space on the one hand, but with ITAR and with the regulations, um, more enforced regulations, and, and that has changed, right, um, a little bit. But you, with this happening, um, we lost a third of our... Uh, satellite um, base, commercial base, right? When when ITAR started being more enforced because China got a hold of our technology, right? And reversed reversed it. So with all of this convergence and, and divergence of uh, civil national security and um, commercial law, we need to find a balance that's going to promote the innovation um, that's going to promote, promote national security without limiting the innovation or finding a balance there. Right. And that's still going to support civil um, space initiatives. I'm, I'm concerned that we're losing um, uh, really, and, and I'm concerned that NASA is going to lose uh, focus, it, uh, not NASA. I'm concerned that the focus is going to to be removed from NASA and everything that's happened uh, because all of the focus is going on commercial and we're potentially going to uh, lessen funding in, in the coming years. And that has to do with presidential policy, right? So the president changes every four to eight years. And so policy is going to change every four to eight years and how uh, funding occurs is going to change as well. And with who's in Congress and all that. So, um, and when you're talking about projects that take a decade or more to yes, complete, yes. when the policies change every four yeah. years, that can be a little counterproductive, right? Very <laughs> counterproductive, right? Yeah. You know, we look back and, um, you know, the first president Bush wanted to go back to the moon and Mars. And I know that there, you know, there's costs associated with that. And the great thing about commercial space is that, uh, you know, there are people that are putting their money into 
the space industry now. And that's great. And it's encouraging more innovation. And, you know, where it, it's creating this um, snowball effect, which is great. But NASA has done so much and has been so valuable and can still contribute. And I just I, I don't want to see NASA go by the wayside in the meantime. Excellent. So um, when the time comes to settle space, will you be among the first to go? <laughs> uh I would like to go to space. I uh, hopefully they'll come up with a way for me not to deal with uh, motion sickness so okay. much. <laughs> so yeah, I would love to go to space. I would love to see what what's there and um, what we do while we're settling. Maybe I'll be the first Supreme Court justice on on Mars or something. Perfect. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's great. That's yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for being thank here you. with us today. I really enjoyed talking to you and, and you. really enjoyed uh, learning about your, your journey and thank your story. You. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Mission Eve is a production of the Center for Space, Commerce, and Finance, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to educating entrepreneurs and investors about their respective challenges and opportunities as it relates to space. Megan Crawford has been your host and executive producer. Aaron Pagel is the executive director for the center and producer and editor for this episode. Marketing and communications for Mission Eve is managed by Nikki Martinez. Theme music has been composed by Liz Fole. If you'd like to support this podcast, please visit patreon.com slash mission eve to become a monthly subscriber. We have multiple tiers available with benefits like personalized thank yous, access to limited edition t-shirts, opportunities to engage with our interviewees via online Ask Me Anything sessions, and small group gatherings with Megan Crawford when available. Any support you can offer will go a long way to helping us continue to tell the stories of the women who are making life in space a reality. Please follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Center for Space, Commerce, and Finance, Twitter at CSCF underscore nonprofit, and LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash company slash CSCF. Thank you very much for listening.